I'm speaking tonight about nationalising hundreds and thousands of women, women in evacuation in the Second World War. And it's been the basis of um, research that I was doing for a book uh, that came out about a year ago and which the paperback of is coming out this week. Now, let's start with, I think, this very familiar image. It's uh, almost an icon of the Second World War. The young children, gas masks around their neck, um, overly in-resized clothing, labels on them, waiting at a railway station to be evacuated. Operation Pied Piper, as it's called, in 1939, when the Second World War began. It involved over 800,000 unaccompanied school children, over half a million mothers with preschool children and nearly 13,000 expectant mothers being evacuated. In 1939, when the British government perceived that the enemy campaign of mass aerial bombing, bombing was imminent and would lead to injury, death, and they thought mass panic, they looked for a solution to these problems in the domestic homes of many of the more rural areas of England and of Scotland and of Wales, though it operated slightly differently in Scotland. They looked to areas they deemed would be safe and in those areas they decided children would spend the war. The government evacuation scheme encouraged many owners to share their private domestic homes and their space that we all see, I think, as our, um, as our personal place. They had to share it with people they'd never met before, um, they didn't necessarily get on with, um, and they found it, to say the least, very difficult. They had been preparing the government, organising and involving themselves in evacuation for many, many years. And yet, when they did it, it was much more problematic, it was much more difficult, it was much more complex than it turned out. Because the preparation, the organisation, the monitoring, the actually running evacuation in a successful way led to a public interference in what had previously been this private space of the home. It led the government to become increasingly involved in the upbringing of children and all manner of personal and minor things that governments hadn't considered themselves, I suppose, concerned about before. So we'll get on to rubber sheets later, but once you've got a situation where governments are actually paying out for rubber sheets and having discussions about whether mattresses are ruined um, and how much somebody is eat, a child is eating and all these sorts of things, they're getting involved in homes in a very, very different way. So it's quite a different scheme than I think anything that had been seen beforehand. Now, I want to start by just thinking about the evacuee memorial at the National Memorial Arboretum. And some of you may have seen it there. It's quite interesting. It's quite, um, it's right next to the playground, interestingly. Um, people in the evacuee uh, association have struggled to get it put up for very many years. It's set amongst monuments, those who died fighting in military conflicts. And that in a sense is important. It reaffirms the way the evacuees were and saw themselves as part of the people's war. It was done by a very renowned sculptor, Maurice Blink, who designed it. He was a child Holocaust survivor and he intended to encapsulate the fear and the confusion of the evacuees. You might not be able to see, but the bronze statue, it portrays figures um, of not a number of children. And although you look at them uh, and they, at first sight, it looks like just ordinary children, actually, they've been deliberately distorted. Their hands are reversed, they're twisted 180 degrees, their clothes are on back the front, their gloves are missing. In a sense, what it does is to connote the experience of evacuation as one of the absence of an adult. It sort of presents it as children without proper maternal care, where children rely on each other. Look, they're all holding hands. Metaphorically, it's saying something very significant about evacuation. And although the British Association for uh, Evacuation says it's a memorial, not simply to evacuated children, but to all those evacu involved in the evacuation process, to the train drivers and the teachers and the nurses and the billeting officers, and of course, to the parents and foster parents, 
it's intended to portray the greater family and the social upheaval uh, of, of the social of the greatest social upheaval ever experienced in the long history of our country. If you look at it, what it does, in my opinion, is to airbrush from history the thousands of mothers, the sick and the elderly who were evacuated, as well as the young children. It also silences the voices of numerous women who cared for them and the heart rendering decision that mothers who waved goodbye to their children had to make. And so what I've been doing over, hopefully speaking, the best part of 10 years was to explore the experience of these women who were involved in evacuation. Those who've been airbrushed out of history by that sort of iconic image of the children at the station that we saw a moment ago, but also airbrushed out of history by the memorial. Now, if we just start at the sort of beginning of the process, evacuation was not compulsory for um, mothers of children. You could, didn't have to have your child evacuated. It was, however, compulsory to take evacuees, at least theoretically. What this meant was that mothers faced this most horrendous decision. As, and what happened was that as circumstances changed throughout the war, they constantly reappraised it, they changed it, they shift what they were doing, um, uh, uh, and, and the process of their child being evacuated moved and shifted. In 1939, when war became absolutely imminent, it was there was a period when people had um, a sense of fear around bombing really, really strongly in their minds. They were absolutely petrified of what would happen to their children and to themselves, particularly those living in places like London or Portsmouth or Southampton, who saw themselves very much as natural targets. They had, in the years running up to the war, been a real growing paranoia about bombing and bombers. I always remember my childhood being told by my grandmother that she was with friends the day that war was declared and the woman leapt up and covered the budgerigar cage immediately because she was convinced the bombers were coming over the moment war was declared. And that was the general sense of many people. They were aware of the bombing in the First World War. And indeed, one of those bombs hit a school in London and killed many of the children in that school. They'd seen when they went to the cinema on the newsreels, horrendous images of the bombing of um, Guernica and of Madrid in the Spanish Civil War. They had a real sense that actually, when war came and bombing started, as Baldwin, as Prime Minister had said, there was nothing that could be done to stop the bomber getting through and that you know, real death and destruction and danger, and of course, gas attacks were very strong in their minds, were on their way. So, you know, as war arrives, this produces a sense of immense fear in, in, the, in, the, in the, I think, lives of mothers. And just two quotes that I've put up there, and hopefully you can see, I think really make that clear. Vera Britton, whose children were evacuated overseas, and, uh, and they spent the war in most of the war in the USA said, such an effort I think in spite of myself to, have, to bring up a child through its first 10 years of life and now for what? That absolute fear that she'd put all this effort into having two children and they could be obliterated by bombing. Margaret Kennedy, who chose not to have her children evacuated, recalled that if previously in times of difficulty, trouble and anxiety, she said they were a source of consolation to her and now she could hardly bear to, to look at them. They were like a sword in her heart because this horrendous decision that she felt she had to make. What happened was there was a lot of to and froing as a result. In the first part of the war, 1939, many, many people had their children evacuated, absolutely frightened that the bombers were coming over at any moment. Um, and then we have the period of the phony war. Actually, the bombers do not come over. They've had them evacuated, but actually they're, they're, they're apart from them, but there is no danger. So slowly but steadily, they bring them back. And in fact, the vast majority, when they come home for Christmas, if they haven't already come home, never go back to their, to their, um, their billets. Then of course, mothers change their minds again when bombing really begins and when the blitz begins. 
Um, and there are some very strong stories of, of mothers who were not going to have their children evacuated. And then, you know, the fear of bombing is so great that they change their minds. And what happens with some of them is that they to and fro, they have them evacuated, then the bombing dies down, they bring them back again, then bombing or the doodle bugs come again and they have them evacuated again. There's a lot of toing and froing. And there are three main phases of evacuation. That first blip that we know about in 1939, which often a lot of the images are about, often people talk about, another very big blip that comes in 1940 to 41, when the main part of the Blitz, particularly in London, is going on, and that dies down again by 42, 43. And then in 44 and 45, when the doodlebugs come, there is a massive evacuation from London and below in the country uh, of people further up the country. For the mothers, it's a horrendous, horrendous experience. Vera Britton talks and writes very eloquently on it and about that process of taking her children to um, Southampton, um, of seeing them, you know, go through the, the crowds of children um, in, on their way to get on the, on the boat. And she says, now that the moment has actually come, my legs suddenly feel as though they will no longer sustain me. My poor darlings, is the time to call you back um, from salvation even now. Beyond the enclosure where the kids are, she sees a gray painted hulk of the anonymous line we can carry with us the dearest possessions that are ours on this earth. So it's a, it's a heart rendering decision. And the ways in which the mothers deal with it is very varied. Um, in the oral histories, and, and because not many of the mothers have left records, you have to really tease out from a big oral history project we did in Staffordshire, but for lots of other autobiographies, oral histories, the experience of the mothers. And this, I think, is one really typical one, where the lad talks about, my mother kept polishing our shoes. She kept saying, we must get these polished. It's very important. I suppose it gave us something to do to stop crying. She kept going over the list of things we had, toothpaste, toothbrushes. Being poor, we only had one tube of toothpaste between the three of us. And she kept saying, I don't know how you're gonna manage if you're split up, I still don't know. And for many of the mothers who were really um, very short of money, actually the provision of all the things they were supposed to have to be evacuated um, was, was a real problem. Um, and that's one of the reasons that some people chose not to have their children evacuated. They really couldn't fit them out. It's heart rendering story of, of a woman where there was one towel between the household and she, she tore it up into pieces to divide it between the five children, producing something like a face towel, a face flannel to, to give them. Um, there were various ways that those mothers developed to look after their children and care for their children and ensure that they were doing so even though they'd made the decision to send them away. Um, one story that I re read was about two boys who were given this instruction by their mother. They, she gave them a postcard and she said to them, if your billet is okay, then um, you put three kisses on the end of the message you send me back um, and I'll know you're all right. If it's two, then um, I'll know it's sort of okay and I'll try and come and see you. If it's one, I'll be on the train immediately to come and get you back because I'll know it's horrendous. So she worked out this code so that she'd know if her children were okay. Um, there were various ways they sent messages, they sent postcards. A lot of them, if they couldn't go themselves, sent siblings. Um, there's a heart rendering story of a little boy who was sent um, to uh, evacuated to America, whose mother sewed him this, this red life jacket, a red jacket to go inside his life jacket that he must never take off at any point in time. Some mothers who couldn't bear to have their children go uh, without them volunteered to go as helpers um, in order to, to make sure that they were evacuated with their children. But that was a problem because then they left their husbands behind or maybe older members of the family behind or maybe elderly relatives. So it was not an option open for many of them. Um, some of them followed after their children. When their husbands had been called up, then they would go um, taking jobs in the area near where their children were. Many of them sent parcels of sweets and, um, and letters and clothes and so forth. So there is a huge number of women involved in this heart rendering decision send their children away. 
And then when those children, and there is a, a, an amazing process um, with the teachers, the teachers have been practicing and getting ready to, to, to be evacuated with their schools. A large number of teachers were, were women. They went with their schools. It was um, an interesting experience for them. Um, some of them were very well prepared. They had their bag full of barley sugars to keep the, the children uh, quiet and from being sick on the train. Some of them found it much more uh, stressful than they'd expected. Many of them, um, were quite critical of, of the mothers for being too emotional. Some of them were not. Um, uh, many of them were kept, the, the, the mothers were kept back from the stations and, and behind barriers with police at the stations. And the teachers took charge, assisted by the WVS and a variety of helpers. Um, when they got them to the billet at the other end, then again, it was an army of women in the main who were the billeting officers trying to arrange where each of these children would go. Um, and this is just a, a description from one of them who talks about, you know, 20 women in the area worked hard to find enough homes. Um, you know, th lots of people didn't actually want to take, take them. They had to try and match the homes in terms of who would be prepared to take them. Although the government gave the, the local authorities the power to force people to take children um, quite rightly, this billeting officer doesn't feel that it's something that they wanted to do. They felt it would be unpleasant for children to try and put them in a home they weren't wanted. Um, so they tried to match it up, tried to get, you know, volunteers who'd be happy um, and uh, supportive and welcoming to and I was, some of them very much were. But, um, what happened on the days that they did the evacuation and those first just before and just after the war began was that actually many of the mothers changed their minds again and again so about whether their children should be evacuated so when the government planned evacuation they had planned a space for every rural urban child every child in danger to be evacuated but when it came to large numbers weren't and so they would count the numbers of children at the station and then they would start rearranging things. They would think that they'd got 200 unaccompanied children to go in one place, but actually they'd only got 100. So then they loaded in a whole dose of, of, of pregnant mothers or people with small children and so forth. And the result was as they changed their plans again and again, that people had no notion what was going on at the other end. Um, and that meant that, that towns and villages was, were waiting for children to arrive. Stone and Staffordshire waited for four days with their welcoming committee and their biscuits and their drinks for them. They never turned up. Um, others were expecting a whole troop of, of, of a boys' school and had sorted out where they were going, only to discover they'd got a whole train full of pregnant mothers. Um, some were expecting small children, got older children, and vice, vice versa. So what happened was a level of chaos, it has to be said. Um, this was a day with very few phones, no mobile phones, um, and not the best levels of communication between central and national government as it got organized. So the children were set off and armies at the other end of um, billeting officers were trying to sort out where they would go. Welcome committees in many of the villages organized by everything from the WI to the WVS to just local groups of women, um, giving them drinks and biscuits and some level of, 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 of medical care. Um, on a good day, there was a very careful organization of where they were all going, but actually with all the changes in the plans, there was often what, what has been described as almost like a cattle market of trying to match them up. Um, what became interesting was that some people would take enormous numbers of children. Um, their houses were full to the brim. Some people almost made up a, a, a job out of it, taking as many as 10 and 12 children in one cottage. Others avoided doing so. And Peter Cotton, who we interviewed in Staffordshire, talked about he was very keen to have an evacuee. He wanted his mum to bring, bring home a play friend for him. She ended up taking three children. Um, uh, 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 and, and their mother when she was bombed out. And then she took in a physically and mentally handicapped child. But he recalls, I can't remember anyone else having evacuees. We wonder why, because they'd only got one child. Um, and a lot of them talk about the inequality in where the children get evacuated. In our minds, I think we have a sense of um, evacuation as these children from urban areas and their families, 
ending up in huge big stately homes like the Lion, the Rich and the Witch and the Wardrobe book. And it's very, very rare that actually the majority of them were billeted in working class homes with very minimal levels of water and sewage um, and very minimal space. What happened was that between the process of planning, beginning to plan evacuation in 1938 and when it happened in 39, very many middle class people filled up their homes with friends and family and friends of friends so that they didn't have to have um, people who were evacuated by the government. And just to put it in its framework, the way it was decided technically as to how many evacuees you could have is there was a count up of all the number of rooms in your house, each bedroom, kitchen, lounge, what have you. Uh, then the number of adults who were living in was taken off and anything left um, was the number of evacuees you technically had space for. Though everything I've read indicates, like this person, Peter, who's talking about it, that many people were absolutely squashed into tiny billets. And uh, whilst there were other people with huge houses, which didn't seem to have anybody in them. Not least, I think, in that was that very often the people who were in charge of billeting were um, the great and the good, uh, the better off, the vicar's wife, a lot of teachers found they were doing it. Um, and maybe they felt it was more difficult to pressurize people who, from their social support than it was to pressurize um, other people and, and groups. Now, within 24 hours of the arrival of evacuees, in many areas, billeting officers were absolutely overwhelmed. The level of difficulty that there was about moving children from one part of the country to another with um, very different accents, with very different ideas about food, about hygiene, about what was done where and at what time, um, and uh, created just chaos. So, you know, adult evacuees were horrified that they might, they might be in rural cottages where there was no water, no washing facilities, and they had to go to the loo down the garden. Um, other people, uh, they found the places damp and inconvenient. Um, Lots of the billeters said the adult evacuees were un unadaptable. They behaved as if they owned the house or as if they were, you know, a guest who should be treated very well. Others complained they were communists. Some people said their manners were deplorable. Everyone said everyone's manners were deplorable. They all complained the children wet the beds, which is hardly surprising. Poor little mites, they were frightened out of their wits. Um, many said the children were sent with inadequate clothes. Absolutely, because they were sent with clothes that were suitable for playing the streets of London or Portsmouth or Birmingham, not necessarily clothes that were suitable for playing in the fields of Staffordshire. And many people said that the evacuees would not eat the food they were provided because, of course, food was a very regional thing at that point in time. The sort of food that was available to cook and to eat at a reasonable price in a town might be very different from in an urban area. And that created a lot of difficulties and tensions. Um, that being said, there was an enormous level of caring and concern by kind-hearted foster mothers who greeted many of them, their new, um, family and their visitors with cooked meals, with much excitement, um, uh, you know, loved them and cared for them unbelievably. For some, it was, it was still not what they wanted. There was one who, who recalled, they took me into their lovely home. I was given my own bedroom. They gave me a Scotch Terrier and I'd never had a pet before. My foster parents were so kind. They gave me the first holiday I ever had. We went to Blackpool but I only stayed nine months and missed my family too much. So some of them were working so hard, these foster mothers, and yet still, you know, not unreasonably, the children just wanted to go home. There was a huge amount of extra work and responsibility in looking after unaccompanied children. It was seen as exploitative by some, especially on those who were living on very limited resources. Um, the extra washing, the um, extra fuel that could be consumed. People were, were mind blown if they were wealthy enough to have electricity to discover how much their electricity went up and their heating went up and their washing when everything went up. Um, 
And many of them felt that it was quite exploitative, particularly in an era when they saw many other women doing very nicely out of the war. Maybe they were um, getting higher wages and munitions. Maybe they were getting free uniform if they were in the armed forces. So there was a lot of tension around it. There was a huge amount of extra domestic labor in caring for children who were evacuees. Um, it was recognized to some degree. So you know, looking after evacuees was seen as mutually um, exclusive in terms of paid work. And when conscription was introduced for women at the end of 1941, if you had evacuees, you didn't have to have to work. And they were paid expenses. But it's sort of typical of these things that those expenses were in a sense um, inadequate if you were really caring for the child well. Um, but on, in other circumstances, they were being used um, to earn money and the children were being scrimped and saved on. So there was a real, a real issue about it. As we said, you know, um, there was no bombing in the first months. Many, many children went home. Although, whatever the narratives we have now, whatever the sort of rumors and stories that you hear, and we do hear the worst and most bleak stories about evacuation often. All the psychologists and the surveys and the interviews, and there were many done on the ground at the time, indicated that the vast majority of children were happy in their billets. Despite the endless rumors and anecdotes of tensions and financial pressures, many did return home. Um, and the second evacuation in 1940 had much participation rates at a point in time was really, really um, important. Um, there are all sorts of, I suppose, uh, rumors and, and popular narratives about evacuation, which still surround, and even when we did oral history in Staffordshire, we were mind blown by uh, how many of those still seem to be there 70 years afterwards. So there were a lot of narratives about food and eating habits and stories about, you know, children evacuee children who came home with a chicken saying they, there were many more where they'd got that one from and thinking they were they were helping out their foster mother by snitching a chicken from somewhere. There were lots of narratives of them refusing to eat anything. There were lots of narratives about cleanliness and disease and certainly the pushing all the children together on these trains that took forever to, to, to get them to their billets um, at the end of a holiday without proper inspections, medical inspections in many cases did mean that those who hadn't left London or Birmingham or Bristol or what have you, unhealthy and diseased, many of them arrived in that state. And there was endless discussion about how they were light, uh, light fingered. Um, there was a lot endless, endless stuff written about bedwetting and toilet training. And, um, and there was a lot about how they were ignorant of rural culture and knowledge. Nevertheless, you know, there were still nearly half a million children and 60,000 adults billeted under the government scheme in July to August. And estimates are that there were many, many more who were privately evacuated. And I think one of the things that happens as the war progresses is that, and they're able to do so, many more people arrange evacuation themselves. They speak to friends of friends. They um, try and use places where their husbands work, all sorts of things that will help them find someone they know to send their child to, rather than just leave it up to the, um, up to the, up to the government to do. In 1940, of course, we have quite severe bombing. But we also have, you know, preparations for bombing moving along, but not as fast as we may understand now. So on the left here, you have the um, famous Anderson shelter dug in the garden, a little bit on the damp side, not particularly pleasant, but um, it did require you to have a garden of sufficient size rather than a backyard or be living in flats to have such a shelter. The Morrison shelter that you see on the right, which is delivered and was supposed to be able to fit under a dining table, quite a large dining table. I'm not sure it was quite as comfortable as the uh, little cartoon at the bottom indicates. That didn't actually get delivered in many cases until 41, 42, after the worst of the bombing was over. Um, and there was a sense that, you know, not a lot could be done if the um, 
if bombers came through, there were anti-aircraft guns, but actually they did more harm than good. More people were injured by flak. Very rarely did they actually um, hit anything. Now, on the 7th of December, 1940, in London, what begins is 57 days of consecutive heavy bombing. Day after day, night after night, it lasted really on and off through the Blitz until the summer of 41. Approximately 60,000 children left London in September in organized groups, despite severe air raids. Um, it's still many less left than in 39. And we have to remember that one in 10 of those who died in the bombing was a child. So it was traumatic to have your child sent away. It was traumatic to keep them. Um, and what happened again in earnest in 1940 was evacuation. But finding billets for by this time was not easy because of all the rumors that there had been in the first evacuation, people were trying to avoid actually taking children by the second one. They were aware the very dedicated were looking after them. Many others were not. And May Smith, who is a teacher in Derbyshire, who's a billeting officer, talks about how, you know, she records in her diary how, you know, she realizes in 1940 end of 1940, that an extra 1,200 children are due to come to their area from Birmingham. And she sets off knocking on doors, trying to persuade people to take them. And she gets this very, very negative response from everyone refused her. The only one who agreed was somebody, who, a child in her class when the mother was out. She um, didn't dare to say thought she'd be in trouble. So, you know, many children were not easily able to be evacuated. And in London, many children were suffering if they had remained in London with their families. And what happened was that the mothers were doing a rethinking of how they would manage it. So there were, these images were very familiar with of children who were taken down at night into the um, uh, underground. They would spend the nights there. Um, as Alfred Morris recalled, it was grim, it was dirty. It was, when it was quiet, rats came out, uh, but it was safer than being upstairs. The stench was awful, the space was limited. They used to leave sometimes granny down there during the day to keep their place. The trains were often operating at night. Um, and what greeted them when they came out of the shelters was awful. Um, one young boy described there was a block next door to where we lived in the basement, a bomb had been dropped on it. Um, and the person who lived there was blown to bits all over the railings. Um, and the 15 year old son was killed. He was lying in the road with no head, no arms and a bit of his shoulder was gone. And I didn't recognize him. So the children in the towns were suffering fear. They were suffering the horrors of going into very mixed provisions in terms of shelters that were dirty and unpleasant. Um, and as a result, as the reality of the blitz hit, what happened was that many mothers, not unreasonably, gathered up their children and just fled. It was what was called, I talk about it as the people's evacuation. It was a freelance, unorganized evacuation. People just got on trains to anywhere. People, just like the people uh, uh, after the Coventry bombing who got in cars if they had them and drove till the petrol was gone. Some people walked, some people went in any way they could could to get away and they would descend upon various parts of the country at the end really of the um at the train line or as far as they could afford the ticket to go so you know reading was absolutely flooded with large quantities of people arriving there um, and it was just related to the bombing they would be put up in temporary shelters in church halls um, uh, and her, um, where they were the looked after cinemas would be used. Uh, the dirt and the stench in some of these places was absolutely appalling. When Vera Britton goes during the Blitz to, to Oxford, she's just mind blown by the, the degree of the number of people who are there and the degree of sort of a crowding and desperation of the people who have just charged out of London. Um, she said, I had thought Oxford Station as closely crammed with humanity as my limited, as limited space could possibly achieve. But now looking at the high street, I find I was wrong. 
Up and down the great curving thoroughfare, packed almost too close for movement and pushing one another from the pavement into the gutter, struggles a crowd which varies from Harris Dons in tweeds to weary homeless mothers from Poplar and Plasto, dragging small bewildered children by the hand. There is an absolute desperation. And in Oxford, they turn a huge cinema into a temporary hostel. And she goes into this and she describes it um, in this, this very graphic way with covering the floor beneath upturned velveteen seats of the cinema chairs, disorderly piles of mattresses and pillows and rugs and cushions. People stake out pitches. Um, and these mothers lying on the floor with their children beside them in horrible, horrible air. And they're still there at 11 o'clock. Um, and there's soiled newspaper, there's ancient apple cores, it's all grim, but the, as the WVS tell her, they're almost too dazed and quiet after they've been through in just a few nights of bombing in London um, to be able to do anything. They're just despondent, lying on the floor. So there is this frantic people's evacuation, these mothers desperate to get out of London with their children. Um, they would stay sometimes for a little while, they would stay for weeks, for months, for years. Some never went back to London. Um, and they were not always, particularly the mothers and children, with really quite the, the, the kindness and welcome that they might have been, and one might hope they would have been, given that they were um, experiencing and, and, and getting away from the Blitz. And this comes, this, this little exchange comes from um, a billeting officer describing the problems she has in, in, in parts of Norfolk, where she thinks she's got a home for a mother and the children. Poor Mrs. Wright with her children. You know, she's turned away by this the mother. Betty Pooley was a 31-year-old mother of two young children who, you know, decides after the bombing actually begins that the protection provided by her, her reinforced table is not really very good when the bombs are nearby. She gets a train fare from the council and she sets off with her children to King's Cross Station. Uh, she just gathers herself, puts herself behind the line of evacuating mothers and children and ends up in Yorkshire. She said, we were the last to be chosen by the country people because I kept saying, does anyone have a cottage? I didn't want to be billeted where I'd have to share. Finally, someone finds her a gardener's cottage on an estate. The gardener's been called up, the lady of manor explained. Um, and she never interfered. She was very kind. She gave her six eggs a week. To, she gave her children six eggs a week to bring home to her. They looked after her when she went into labor. She was pregnant with her third child. They comforted her when her child was born with spina bifida and died. So some were desperately kind. Some I'm afraid were not. Um, as the time wore on, the tensions really began to grow. There were tensions where there were children who were unaccompanied. There were tensions where there was sharing of houses between um, women and their families. There was what I've termed enforced domestic intimacy. Lots of people living together who are not used to living together. Um, and people get very anxious about things. We have descriptions of um, little child who couldn't bear that somebody strange, a stranger to her was looking at her knickers and seeing through her private things. Another who sees um, uh, her foster mother doing a great and just says, you know, I don't, my mother doesn't do it that way. And she's smacked because the foster mother is so anxious about the criticism and the difficulties that she's facing. In a sense, families and, and domestic spaces, they're constructed through practices, connections, relationships and traditions. They're socially determined. It's to do with your class, your region, your age, your religion. Lots of tensions over religion. Um, and they shape the way you do everyday life. We all do it slightly differently. Um, we eat at different times in different ways. Priorities in terms of the choice of food. All the minutiae of how people live their life comes into relief with evacuation and this clashes um, between foster mothers and their children and uh, women who are billeted with other women um, with their children. There was also a sort of resentment, I think, that grew because of the way they felt they were being treated and the way in which many of the foster mothers felt that the government was, to put it politely, slightly taking the piss. <laughs> That's the only way I can put it. Um, and this 
extract from Home and Country, the Women's Institute, really, I think, emphasizes it because they're, they're sort of saying everybody else is being paid for their services and for working. But actually, us mothers, we're not being paid. We are being asked to do this massive extra work as foster mothers. Um, we may have experience of children. Some of them hadn't. Some of them were desperate for children and loved it. Some of them absolutely loathed it. I mean, I'm somebody who couldn't even get to the end of my children's birthday parties without being desperate for one to go. So I'm, I'm sympathetic. Um, and so a lot of tensions occurred. Also, a lot of tragedies occurred. Um, many children felt they were unwelcome. Mary Rose Benton has described her appalling experience of being evacuated to Stafford, uh, separated from many of her brothers and sisters. She said, we knew we were unwelcome. We came from Margate and our Southern accents marked us out as strangers. She says, I remember seeing Vackies go home scrawled on the side of a static water tank and adding, we want to. In other cases, there were terrible tragedies that the children who'd been sent to the countryside to be safe um, actually were not. I spoke to Ellen Hill's younger brother. Uh, Ellen had been evacuated from Margate when there was fears of invasion in 1940. She drowned in the River Trent in Staffordshire. Um, and Interestingly, in the report from the coroner, the coroner is dismayed that this is the third evacuee who is drowned in the river. These were children who were not used to um, the sort of trials and tribulations of the countryside, the dangers and the issues around it. Um, so there were some really horrendous stories, others who became ill, all sorts of things. I think in thinking about the trials and tribulations, it's also worth remembering that it didn't have to be a domestic experience. Keeping children safe did not have to be to put them in their in domestic homes. There was the building of a number of camp schools. And uh, there were two in Staffordshire, one at, um, I hope you're still getting me on the internet. So there was one, um, uh, called Piper's Wood for girls, one shooting box for the boys. And you can see pictures of them here. They're all having an absolutely riotous time. All the oral histories we've got of the kids who are in these camps, totally positive, absolutely loved it. Um, partly because they didn't feel they were outsiders. They were all in, in there together, partly because they were wonderfully well organized by a real idealist. Um, so it didn't have to be homes that people went into. That was a choice that was made at the time, partly because of resources being focused on, um, on the building up of the armed forces and building um, uh, aerodromes and all sorts of munitions factories and so forth, partly because some people felt it would be um, more dangerous to put children in great groups together, but also because I think there was, it was just taken for granted that women would look after other women's children and it's not a minor matter. There's also a sense that a whole plethora of extra areas of support and systems of governments have emerged because of evacuation. So having got the children there, then there was the, the need to have social workers and medical inspections and child guidance clinics to help uh, with the children who were, were, were struggling and hostels for children who were ill or were difficult. Um, there were special hostels we found in Staffordshire for, for children who were particularly prevalent with bedwetting. Um, they had to get involved in, in providing and supporting all sorts of equipment in the homes where they were looking after evacuees. So they had to give rubber sheets to, to, to foster mothers, they had to replace mattresses, they had to do inspections to decide if mattresses really needed to be, to be replaced. Um, they had to give free uh, postage and subsidized travel for parents to visit their children. So it became really a complex thing. The government was massively involved in all areas of childcare and children's lives that they once hadn't been. And it became incredibly messy who was responsible for children? Was it the foster mother? Was it the, um, was it the teacher? Was it the biological mother if you could trace them? It's an awful story we came across in Staffordshire with this poor little mite who'd got terrible toothache and the dentist wanted to take out their tooth and nobody could decide who it was who should make the decision. 
um, and who was responsible for making the so a huge amount of government agencies became involved and a plethora of voluntary services and organizations became involved a local and national government but then volunteers now the women's voluntary service did masses and masses of things and this picture on the left is from one of their um their clothing exchanges they set up shoe exchanges and clothing exchanges whereby um Bakui children who'd grown out of their clothes or their shoes could, the, the clothes could be taken, the shoes could be taken and exchanged for bigger ones. And these were a real lifesaver for many people in the countryside. Lots and lots of um, voluntary organizations began to provide food and meals to support the evacuees and to, to support their foster mothers. Um, there were lots and to, afford, and to support the mothers who'd been evacuated with their children. So there were all sorts of, um, sort of centers for them to go to set up uh, where they had a nursery set up for them. There were mounds of parties set up for, uh, for evacuees and their mothers. So uh, all sorts of voluntary organizations became very involved in support, um, of evacuees. Now local authorities, particularly as the time went on and things got more and more difficult and it became much more difficult to find homes for, evacuees began to exert their power, the government power that had been given to them to force people to take evacuees if they couldn't find homes for, for children. Um, and the leak Post and Times, for example, reported three people being charged for failing to comply with a billeting notice and noticed that they had to take some, some evacuees. Mrs. Bocock, who lived in a three bedroom house, had been asked to take a woman and her three children, despite having had two operations, which had left her in poor health. When she wasn't prepared to do so, they asked her to pay very heavy and take off. So there was a compulsory powers beginning to be brought in to force people to take strangers into their homes. And that caused, again, a lot of resentment. As the bombing eased, and the time went on, children began to drift back. Some were taken back just at the end of the, of the first blitz in 1941, some staying into 42, 43. It would depend on a number of circumstances. Some were taken home when um, proper shelters were built in the road in which they live. So it, it moved, uh, some to and fro. But actually there was a sense that um, many of the biological mothers of the children felt they were losing their children. They were really scared that the children were gaining different accents and different habits, that they didn't recognize them when they went to visit them, um, and they desperately wanted them back. And that's problematic because the bombing did not stop. It was less extreme, but it continued. And particularly, it continued famously when it hit Sandy Lane School in 1943 where there were two children, Eric and Kitty Brady, who had been brought back from Wales. They'd first been evacuated to Folkestone and then to Wales um, because their mother was anxious about the degree to which she was losing her children. When the Blitz got very bad, Kitty's foster parents in Wales had written to their parents of um, Eric and Kitty Brady and said, look, we know how bad the bombing is, should it be that you are killed, we'd like you to write something in this awful event so that we could adopt Kitty, um, so that she doesn't get caught in the system, so that she doesn't go into a home or anything else. The mother was horrified at the suggestion that somebody would adopt her child. And so although she couldn't immediately, when her husband was ill, she brought them back from um, Wales to London. Then the bomb hits the school. And the mother, as soon as she knows the bomb has hit the school, is absolutely distraught. Um, she um, is, you know, riven with guilt. She lies on the sofa crying, repeating it's all her fault. She waits for news. She finally hears that Kitty has died just after she was taken to hospital, and Eric is badly injured and indeed Eric spends the next 18 months in a hospital. He was left permanently with, with, with some damage as a result of it. The poor mother becomes suicidal um, and she was finally taken into a psychiatric hospital 
when on one of her visits to her daughter's grave, she had a chance meeting with the foster parents who were in London and wanted to see the grave. Her state deteriorated to the level that actually she, she ended up in a padded cell. She did recover sufficiently to come home, but she never recovered from the guilt and the anxiety that she felt that she had brought her child home too soon and that one of her children was dead as a result of it. For some, the end war brought a happy reunion, but not so for all. Um, sometimes uh, it was uh, the children who were very reticent to go home. Sometimes it was foster mothers who were very reticent, having been looking after a child for maybe five or six years to send the child home. Some of them took them home and delivered them off. Sometimes one of the parents had been killed and the other was hard to trace. And Rich Walsh talked about how, you know, at the end of the war, they were lined up in the school hall and they were told by one of the teachers, you're all going back apart from the Walshes. That was him and his sister. Um, and his mother had a sense that perhaps he would be better off and she had just disappeared. We found by doing um, an exploration and oral histories in a place where people had been evacuated to an enormous number of children who were adopted and who never went home at the end of the war. Some did go home and there was a lot of tension when they went home. Home. Some of them, it's quite clear, played up. Some of them um, were very unfamiliar to uh, their parents. Uh, one of Vera Britton's friends described how when her child came back from America after three or four years, she felt that she'd got the older sibling of the child who'd gone. She didn't recognise the child. Some of the relationships were damaged beyond all rare, really. For some, it was a happy ending. For some, they survived. For some, they gained a relationship both with their foster family and their real family or their biological family. And they maintained that for many years afterwards, going and spending holidays with their, um, uh, with their foster families and so forth. But it's a very mixed picture. Um, at the end of the war, the foster mothers got a, got a letter from the king thanking them for their war service. Um, they didn't get a medal, but a letter. And in the post-war era, the child with a label on became a symbol of the war. And the, sim and the child with the mother and the child became a symbol of the peace. And I think it's very interesting that I think um, there was this sort of sense, really, that uh, after the war, mothers and children together was an, was was the ideal and that was the way that people should go. The foster mothers I think have tended to be forgotten um, and wiped sort of out of history and I particularly liked the little mention they managed to get in a sense sort of surreptitiously in there in the recent Paddington films where Aunt Lucy explains to Paddington as he stowed away in a lifeboat for Britain there was once a war, thousands of children were sent away, left at railway stations with labels around their necks, and unknown families took them in and loved them like their own. That in the main is absolutely what happened to children, um, though some had an appalling time. Now, if you've enjoyed this and you want to hear more, there's two bits I can point you to. One is History West Midlands, um, website, there's a number of podcasts I've made um, and a short film we've made about it, but also very excitingly, the Women and Evacuation book finally comes out in paperback this week, but you may have questions. I can see from the little thing, there are some questions coming my way. So